Shiltash. I'm the head of the Department of Security Studies uh, here at SETA Foundation. I would like to thank you, welcome you to the first part of our SETA Security Talk series. Uh, we came up with this series as a way to address the many regional transformation that we are witnessing in the Middle East while providing a forum for those interested to share their views and ideas. Uh, throughout the series, we will look at the drivers of the transformation, their possible outcomes for the region and how the transformation are being perceived by the general uh, population. So I'm pleased to welcome you to the first of uh, our security talks entitled Violent Non-State Actors from Anarchists to Jihadists, which will be given by Professor Ersel Aydınlı, who will publish a book of the same title in July of this year. Professor Aydınlı is a professor of international relations at Bilkent University and the executive director of the Turkish Fulbright Commission. Professor Aydınlı works on the topics of non-state actors, transnational politics and security, and Turkish politics and foreign policy. His past books include the titles such as Emerging Transnational Insecurity, Governance, a Status Transnationalist Approaches, Paradigms in Transition, Globalization, Security and, and the Nation State and Yöntem Kuram Komplo Türk Uluslararası İlişkiler Disiplininde Vizyon Araçları. Today, uh, the professor will discuss with us the topic of his upcoming book, which look at evolving importance of non-state actors in global politics. This will include looking at the historical trajectories of non-state actors in order to understand what their future roles might be, which when related to current events in the Middle East, will provide for a really interesting discussion. So thank you for you again, and the floor is yours, Professor. Okay. Koyayım da şöyle bir yere ya da aşağı koyayım. Nasıl? Tamam bu ileri geldi şöyle. Ha tamam. Murat thank you. Um, <coughs> In this, under these weather conditions, if you came all the way to here to listen to this talk, I better present something interesting, <laughs> right? So that adds to the stress. Um, first of all, I, I, I really would like to thank for the invitation. Um, I forgot about the book, so when you called, I remember there is a book coming out, so I better refresh my mind about it. Um, the other thing I really would like to quickly um, mention that uh, the security studies and all that, there is something interesting about security studies. There is also sim similar, I think, phenomena on a lot of other, but security studies, um, it always appears that we have so many people who can talk about security studies or security, insecurity challenges, yet we don't have a lot of security studies concentration in Turkey. And that's a little unfortunate because Turkey has always been the recipient of a lion's share almost from security, insecurity, all kinds of challenges. Um, and for example, off the top of my head, there are two dimensions. One is the, the concentration on the security sector, of course, reforms and all that, and the other is the security challenges. And Turkey has had its own big share from both in terms of challenges, you know, the terrorism, terrorist waves. Turkey received a big chunk from every terroristic wave. Even the Ottoman times, anarchist wave hit Istanbul. Very few people remember. And then when there was the um, right, left wing, ideological, you know, terrorist confrontation, Turkey again took its lion's share. 1970s was almost a civil war in this country. And when there was an ethnic-based terrorism, 
wave in the world, Turkey again took a big share with the PKK experience. And when there was the time for a religiously motivated terrorism, Turkey again took a big share and Istanbul bombings took place. Uh, so from the practice of it, technically, we, we, we've been always a big recipient of it. So definitely we need to study it more. We need to, we need to have places and concentration areas. With respect to the security sector part of it, of course, this land is famous for its coups, tons of coups. You know, the, our security sector always was too dynamic, led to all kinds of coups. That should be studied as well. And I know that you guys are getting ready for a conference. And those are, I think, um, too important to ignore in, in, in Turkey. So again, um, congratulations for um, initiating such a, such a process. Because the systematic studies, um, when it comes to security, and we are going to discuss the violent non-state actors, is, um, is generally lacking. Um, there are a lot of studies, but systematic studies, for example, what I mean by systematic, taking a subject matter, really working on it, having even the concentration areas, research debates, and even issues of the journals who are concentrating on that, that generally does not take place in Turkey on many, on, on many key issues, and security is one of them. So in that sense, I was, again, very happy to hear that uh, SETA also was, was getting into um, such an um, endeavor. Now, of course, today's topic and the uh, is the violent non-state non actors. And um, I was, I've been working on terrorism, counter-terrorism issues for some time. I'm a, I'm a former practitioner, in fact. Not, not practitioner of terrorism, but <laughs> practitioner of, in a sense, counter-terrorism. I, I mean, in my previous life, um, I was working for the government. I was in, the, uh, in Istanbul, and I, I was part of the, in, in the counterterrorism department. So I was able to observe some of the governmental practices with respect to terrorism. So uh, later, throughout my academic career, I wanted to make a good combination of those observations with the, with the academic um, knowledge and the issues. That is always the best one if you can. You know, it's, it's tough to do. But So later, when we realized that all these kind of different terrorism waves and the terrorism actors, uh, it became clear also with the advance of the globalization that these, are, these would have to be really studied as agencies. What are they that we are facing, right? Because otherwise, we always see either this terrorist group, that terrorist group, or this group which practices violence, that group. And then we lose really the larger picture and the larger structure. So essentially, all of these um, violent groups, most of them who are practicing either terrorism or, or similar forms of violence to that, are non-state actors most of the time. So therefore. I thought, why not? You know, I should try to maybe do some work on the nature of non-state actors. And then, when when I was looking into it, of course, the I, because of this violent jihadist move in the last uh, two three decades, um, the, the those with a global potential were more important in my mind. So I tried to look at the one of the earliest examples of the of non-state actor with a global kind of motivation or a global outreach, and those were anarchists. I'm not going to say a lot of things about the anarchists, but uh, because th uh, there is more to say about the later groups, it is interesting that, for example, in late 19th century, when a group of people threw dynamites into the coffee shops and killed 28 people in Paris, that was almost 9-11 for the Parisians. When that happened, when, when, when that happened, and then when people realized that their either lifestyle or their natural life, ordinary life, was, was threatened by a group of people, you know, at any time possible, 
it was almost 9-11 for them. And when that started taking place in different capitals of the European countries, in the United States, and even in Ottoman Empire in Istanbul, all the countries were in shock because suddenly people were coming in out of the blue. They were killing indiscriminately civilians in big numbers. So then there was a reaction to that too. And then countries got together, just like what happened in the last three decades. They wanted to, they wanted to organize, coordinate the, their efforts. They came up with conferences. And, and, and then the anarchists reacted to that too. And for example, one of them went and killed the US president. So it's not that for the first time we are seeing some global violent non-state actors. And then it's not for the first time we are seeing some countries who are trying to get together basically uh, put an end put an end to this it's it's an old practice informal violence non state actors with global aims is not a new thing and it won't be it won't end most probably near future and i'll tell you why it won't it won't um, end with respect to non non, uh, non state actors you know you might you know, in international relations literature, we always discuss, hey, which one, uh, the states are the most important actors, and some people think that non-state actors, you know, they're not that important. They may be only important if they are either supported by the states or if, you know, if they are allowed to do certain acts. Um, there is this quote. This Pakistani president, Sardari, was visiting Ankara, and I was interviewing with different people, and then I, I had a talk with them as well when I was writing uh, certain uh, sections for this book. <laughs> when I asked him so, what he thought about non-state actors, because Pakistan is being heavily involved in, and this is what he told me. And it really does explain well, actually, where, what type of world we are living in, and, and how how mixed the international politics are now, how states and non-state actors are, are, are basically um, are, are mixed up. Technically speaking, in a normal international relations, right, in order to get a superpower into a war against another state, I don't know, would take probably a, almost like a, a major crisis and then major negotiations and major conflict and all kinds of diplomacy. And this is what he told me in that case. He said one non-state actor basically, with the help of another non-state actor, Fox TV, were able to bring American power into a war against some other non-state actors. It is, it, this, this gives us an idea what type of world global politics uh, we live in. Um, the old paradigm is obviously changing. What was the old paradigm? The old paradigm was that, you know, that, that it was very state-centric. States did represent the societies. States kept also the, the, the dissidents under pressure, negotiated with each other in the name of diplomacy. They sometimes did war, sometimes did peace, and then we continued our life. That has been changing for a long, long time now. And, and in two ways that global power is shifting, in two distinct ways. One of them is geographically. We all know that, of course. There are new states emerging as powerful states. Some old states are losing power, or the nature of power is changing. For example, Europe right, is losing some power-centric power uh, influence. And then some new countries or new areas are emerging. Asia is emerging, and also uh, Eurasia is, is very dynamic in that sense. That's, that's a typical shift that we, we see in long-term international politics, you know, power transition. Some states go up, some states go down. But the other one is an interesting one, power of polities. And there has been also a big change from statehood to non-statehood. Non-state actors also are getting more and more powerful. There is no question about that. 
in, in every sense, they are becoming more and more powerful. And when I say non-state actors, you can think about all kinds of peaceful ones, non-peaceful ones, even though my talk is going to be the violent ones, that the power of the non-state actors are much bigger, much bigger than they, than, than they appear. Sometimes in our graduate classes, we ask this question. In the next 50 years, which one of these, we ask, are going to be around. For example, terrorists, Microsoft, right? Gates Foundation, or countries like, let me name one, Yemen, Israel, or some other countries. It's not easy to give a good answer to this question. It's not. And in fact, when you start thinking about it, you might even say that, hey, you know what? Some non-state actors might, may have a better chance to stay around than some countries. So it's, it's, that, much, it's that much shifting. OK. Here is um, quickly, this is the boring part of my talk. I need to quickly tell you that, uh, that the framework that Murat was referring to that I am using in the book in order to make sense of violent non-state actorness. And then it's, it's a three-way framework called ARI, and autonomy, representation, and influence. And then this is a framework which is built up. I build it up in order to now compare all the non-state actors. So a good violent non-state actor. After this section, I'm going to get into the specifics of the current uh, violence and the violent groups. And there, uh, there we can, uh, then it might become much more co uh, colorful. First of all, a non-state actor, global non-state actor, but particularly a violent one, has to be a has to have some type of autonomy. Autonomy from what? Traditional autonomy from the state. Right? Perfect non-state actor, violent non-state actor, is the one that has no connection with any state. In fact, perfect one is the one that even survey, survives constant state persecution. If all the states are after you and if you still survive, and if you still flourish, if you still are influential, that's, that's a perfect type of statehood, almost non-state non actorhood. And when we think about the Al-Qaeda type of organization, there is not a single country in the universe that has actively supported Al-Qaeda, and it still survived all the persecutions. That is true actorness as we speak. There are tons of states in this world, without other states' support, they can't survive. Yet, this organization has survived the constant global persecution. And these are, and they are very much free from the state involvement, in terms of autonomy, I'm saying, free from the state involvement. What does that mean? States, for example, have financial, political, uh, political contacts with non-state actors most of the time. Today's violent non-state actors, the global one, particularly the violent jihadists, we call them violent jihadists for a specific reason. First of all, in the literature they are called jihadists, but there is a major distinction between violent jihadists and non-violent jihadists. The group that I am interested in understanding are the, the jihadist groups that, that openly choose to be violent in their, in their goals and, and purposes. So keep that in mind also. They are free from state involvement because they don't get financial aid. They have to find it themselves. They don't get political aid. They have to find it themselves. They have to build up allies here and there. They have to find little cracks within these countries and the states and utilize them. So. That that's determines the level of distance they have from the state. They have to be also distancing themselves from the international state system. What does that mean? It basically means that they don't obey to certain international principles, obviously. For example, jurisdiction, right? They are, they're not afraid of any jurisdiction here and there. There is no territorial entity that can say, hey, I'm going to bring you into 
justice in this particular place. They don't. States are responsible, as you know. There are a lot of norms, regulations, standards that the states would have to obey to. For example, genocide-related issues, as you know. It does create binding, binding responsibilities for states, but th those don't exist for, for these... Um, for these violent non-state actors. In that sense, they are sovereignty free. You know, sovereignty is a principle for the states, but comes with responsibilities, and these groups don't really have that one, and therefore, they don't have to obey to the, uh, the responsibilities. Representation, that's another criteria of the framework. In that one, it's a complex one, but I'm going to, there are three important parts of it. First of all, these groups, without any help, they have to generate, regenerate, in fact, interest in themselves. What does that mean? They have to keep attracting members, right? They have to keep bringing people into, into, their, into their groups. And for that, they have all kinds of recruitment strategies. But believe it or not, most of the time we curse them because they are violent, but they have to have some type of legitimacy a legitimate internal understanding so that people do like them and do join in them. And most of the time, you see that the, these groups work very hard to keep this legitimacy. What do they do, for example? They say that they go after a dictator. They go after a, a, an authoritative government. They go after, I don't know, all, all kinds of unjust-looking governance styles. For example, when Bin Laden, when he started his own journey, he was an opposition leader almost in Saudi Arabia, and he kept saying that the Saudi government was not legitimate, was oppressive, was corrupt, all kinds of things. That's how they have to build up some type of legitimacy in order to get people into their grouping. They have to, of course, also maintain their membership. Ma maintain their membership. For that one also, they keep generating loyalty. Here's an interesting thing in the age of globalization. We all have, most of us have multiple loyalties. We have a loyalty to the family, to the country, to our, our uh, other maybe groups that we belong to. But these groups somehow have to, have to generate an identity-based loyalty that their members would have to forget the other loyalties they have, and they have to pay most attention to this group. I'll give you an example. When anarchist movement was booming in 1915, you know, right before the First World War, when the First World War broke out, of course, many national governments called their people into the military service. And it's interesting, most of those anarchists, when they were called into a patriotic game, they basically put an end to their loyalty for anarchism, and they went and they served to their country. That has changed now. We, we know that among the violent jihadists, for example, when they are called into service by their national governments, they're not going. They are making a clear choice be, between different loyalties. Another problem in terms of representation is this managing overstretch, which is sometimes these groups be gr grow too big, too big, and then tons of people join in, tons of people join in, then you have to really manage organizational and ideological overstretch. Organizational means that you have to keep the operational safety. When there are too many people in a group, then the risk starts taking place. I should give you an example. In my, one of my interviews, a Turkish a person who went to Afghanistan told me, in the early 1990s, when Bin Laden and Zawahiri, they were organizing their groups in Afghanistan, they had this idea that they would put all the violent jihadists into the same camp, and therefore, with the idea of Ummah and then the you know, Islamic Brotherhood, they thought would be enough for those people to, to, to build up extra energy. The first week, they realized that there were problems. In fact, for example, one of the biggest fights took place between a Turkish group and a Yemeni group because Turkish group, and this Turkish person even told me that, he thought that the Yemenis were not practicing right type of Islam. 
He thought that the Yemenis were doing something, they were not clean enough. And Yemenis thought that the Turks were something else. And then Saudis thought some others, people from Germany. You know, and then Bin Laden and Zawahiri sat together, they needed to find a solution for this. You know what they did? They separated them, they created national camps. A camp for Turkish violent jihadists, a camp for Yemenis and Saudis. So that was a management of, of overstretch. These issues always are, are a problem. Okay, here is the last part of the, of course the non, non uh, the last part of the framework, non-state actor also has to be influential, right? And it, it has two legs, sustainability and impact. One thing is current violent non-state actors are pretty much deterrent resistant. And it has to be deterrent resistant. What does that mean? It, it, it shouldn't be easily deterred. For example, criminal networks, we have financial violent non-state actors, mafia for example. When the motivation is money, they get easily deterred. You know, if they find the money somewhere else, or if you tell them that they can money launder their money and become legal personalities, they give up. And so they, they move into another realm. But with the political violent non-state actors, you don't have this option. It's not, there is nothing that you can offer or tell them so that they would be deterred. And that, that keeps them also going in terms of their, uh, their influence. The key thing, which I'm going to link it to the countering strategies, is this impact part of it. I, I call the compulsion and transformative capacity. Compulsion means this. You need to, when you are a violent non-state actor, you need to get a reaction. The worst thing can happen to a terrorist organization is being ignored. If you do something, if you kill, if you do an act, and if people ignore you, that's the worst thing can happen to you as a terrorist organization. So you need to be able to generate a reaction. And the compulsion is, in today's violent non-state actors, they get a lot of it. Imagine this. You do an act, 9-11, and then the world superpower declares war on you. And then spends more than $3 trillion. Can you imagine a country which, who can get this attention? Treat more than three trillion dollars. You do one act, and then you make them declare war on you, and then they revise all of their even perspectives on international politics because one act. That's a huge amount of power. I don't. I. I, I don't want to ask, but. Maybe some of you would know. Do you know how much it was spent for the Second World War? Now, the, the money which has been spent after 9-11 in the name of counterterrorism, involving all those also mistakes in Iraq here and there, is almost rivaling now with the money which, has, which was spent for the Second World War by the United States. This, is a, this also tells us what type of a world we are, we are living in. Now, to cut it short, <coughs> okay. Um, wait. A couple of observations. Be because we live in the era of globalization, for example, when the countries were upset with the anarchists, this is what they did in a nutshell, I should tell you. They basically, uh, captured some of the uh, leaders of the anarchist movements, they put them in a train and they sent them in, in exile in Siberia. And that killed the anarchist movement 100 years ago. Why? Because they went to Siberia and they could not reconnect, they could not do the representation, and they could not recruit more, and they, they, they got lonely there, and then the movement died down. And then when... When the current world did the same with the violent jihadists, they sent bin Laden, as you know, into also an exile. They, they sent him to Sudan. He went to Sudan with his jet plane, with his money, with his cell phone, with his aids, and then he reorganized him in a much better way. And then 
when it was problematic there and the international community this time sent them even to where? Afghanistan. So he had even a better chance in Kandahar to do all the organization. Why? Again, we live in a different context with all those communication and other, all the benefits that the globalization have provided. So the point in that that I'm trying to make, the change is a structural one, not an ideological one. It was anarchism 100 years ago. It might be violent jihadism today, but the energy is a completely a sociological one, and it is here to remain. We'll see it, probably the younger generation even is going to see it more so, because we see the empowered individual and then in, in the era of globalization, and some of them with that empowerment will always get together and complain about the system, and some definitely will go violent. So violent non-state actorhood is here to stay definitely. OK, this is the last thing I, I'll show you. Just like any other violent organization or terrorism, uh, this is, I call this terrorism trap. It's, it's going to be in the book, too. Uh, for this is the part I wanted to show, just like I was saying, that the, the, the, the corner, the response part of it. Terrorist actions always take place. When I was in my early 20s, when we were part of the government, we were trying to respond to the, uh, you know, the terrorist incidents. It, we, we would have no idea what was happening before the act as, as counter-terrorists. Right? The act would take place, and then things start rolling. And it can be for so many reasons. This part of the story, up until the terrorist attack, is known. And, and there are things we can do, but there are things we can't do about it. In some countries, it's the personal reason, psychological. In some other countries, nationalist, economic, sometimes tactical, political, organizational, or individual motives do produce violence. And it will produce violence forever. It will never go away the way that the, the, the, the human relations are structured and the way that the global relations are structured. And then, of course, Willingness to kill and die will be there. Socialization, recruitment stage, again, takes different aspects in different countries, but do produce the same outcome. The most, I think, interesting thing in my own experience and in my studies, once the terrorist attack takes place, once a violent non-state actor does something to you, to you, then the response part starts. That's the eye of the bull, actually. That's where either you win or you lose against these violent non-state actors. The, it's not the terrorist act, really. It's your response to the terrorist act determines the fate of the new cycle. If you somehow jump into it without a lot of thinking, if you jump into it thinking that as a populist person, trying to take some measures quickly and comfort your society and make the necessary mistakes. Your mistakes basically feed into all these motives. If you screw up and then if you make the mistake that the terrorists want you to make, then you, you produce all these reasons. I'll give you an example. 9-11 in that sense was a trap by a group of people against the superpower, right? You go hit somebody and then disappear, and then the person you hit basically gets upset and starts hitting all kinds of people in an indiscriminate way and makes mistakes and leads into the reproduction of violence. So in today's world, today's world these terrorist attacks are basically designed with all the intelligence different than the anarchists with all the advantages of globalization to prepare this perfect trap for the countries to fall in. Some countries appear to be doing better than other countries in terms of not falling into this trap. Some countries, in some examples. For example, believe it or not, we, we criticize ourselves very harshly about Istanbul bombings. When it took place, 
For two weeks, Turkey went through a discussion, whether these were in the name of Islam, whether they are not. And the consensus was that, no, this was a terrorist attack. And that was probably the best part of the Turkish response ever given to a terrorism. But the same country, for example, fell into the terrorism trap in 19, early 1980s and early 1990s with respect to PKK terrorism. So, and 9-11 again happened, and the United States basically fell into that trap without looking at it really carefully and went into all kinds of areas. And what happened? Those areas turn into failed states. And in those failed environments, all these motives, whether individuals or organizational, flourished even further, feeding into the cycle. And then that cycle became almost, almost the norm. I should stop. Should I? Yeah, I should stop now. Thank you. Evet, onu öyle yapalım. Okay, thank you very much uh, to Professor Aydınlı. Uh, it was a very fruitful uh, presentation. Of course, I think it's a big challenge, not only for academicians or, or scholars, and uh, but also the governments. I think we should rating uh, when we are discussing the terrorism or non-state uh, armed actor. You know, in terms of you know, by taking into consideration such as you know, sovereignty, geopolitics, or, you know, other kinds of, you know, hot issues in the international relations. And thank you very much again. I think it's time to question uh, questions. Please, you know, introduce yourself before your question. If you like, I think you can ask your question in Turkish as well. Yes. Questions. Yes, please. Ee, merhaba hocam. Murat Bayar ismim. Ee, hangi teröristin tanımını kullanıyorsunuz? Onu sormak istiyorum. Çünkü dünyada e, 80'den fazla terörizm tanımı var. E, ve bu tanıma göre Hamas, Hizbullah gibi örgütler de terörist olarak değerlendirilebiliyor mu? E, sormak istiyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Okay. All right. Uh, th thanks for the question. But you are asking the hardest question. Um, if it's 80, that's a good thing. I thought it was bigger than that, the number. But um, actually, I do have a, my own definition. I use it in my own book, too. But, um, and uh, for me, terrorism is the, of course, is the name of a method between weak and the strong. A weak party, whichever it is, if it has to fight with a strong party, a political fight, right? Since it can't confront the strong in the strong conditions, it has to come up with an asymmetric struggle against it. Right? In the most simplistic sense. In order to do what? in order to bring the strong into proper conditions by a trap like that, in which then the weak has a chance of at least not losing. I don't ever think that terrorist organizations do fight to win because they don't have to win. As long as they don't lose, they survive, the time works into their interest. So I see it more like a struggle between a weak and the strong, it's a method of asymmetric struggle for the weak against the strong. So when it comes to this Hezbollah and others, there, there we, we get into the, all this politics of, politics of terrorism. Everybody, it, uh, here is the thing, the terrorism, the word, is the most politicized, probably one of the most politicized buzzwords ever you can get. Uh, and not only it is different for different countries, but it, the same also, same also organization might change the name in, in, in, in its own lifetime. I mean, 
think about it, right? We are struggling in this country now. How are we going to call, for example, the new PKK? These are, these, are, uh, these are challenging issues. It's a political one. It does change over the time. And it also belongs to the powerful most of the time, which, which makes the definition, which makes the definition. There are some criteria that we all would have to maybe agree. If you are killing the civilians, or some, that's one thing. If you are killing the civilians, defenseless civilians, civilians who are never involved any, in any action against anybody, in my own understanding, you should be labeled as terrorist. For my own understanding. If you are killing unarmed, unofficial, ordinary civilians, then whoever you are, you should belong to the terrorist camp. That's my own understanding. So from that, you can look at all those groups. You know, the groups also you mentioned. If they are killing civilians, this includes also states, because we didn't get into it, but there is something called state terrorism as well. If you are killing civilians, unarmed, defenseless civilians, I think you should be treated as terrorists. That's my own understanding. But it's a highly debated, as you know, highly political issue. Political issue. One other thing uh, with respect to definition, we need to treat it as a name of a method, not as a name of a motivation. That's why I, I don't agree, for example, uh, with definitions. There is nothing called suicide terrorism, for example. There is nothing called, for example, religious terrorism. Those are not types. Terrorism is the name of a method. It might have different motivations. It might be using different motivations as part of the recruitment. That would not qualify to call it as a new brand. It is the name of a method for a week against the strong. It's an asymmetric struggle. Sometimes, for example, you might be using a certain, certain motivation, ethnicity. Sometimes you might think that that motivation is not good enough. You might move into some other motivation, religious one. Sometimes you might even move into completely different one. I'll give you an example. Terrorist organizations do compete. They have to survive. They have to also do well. Otherwise, they die down. I know a lot of terrorist organizations, secular, 100% secular organizations in Middle East, when they realized that they could not compete in terms of recruiting people to do suicide attack, they started employing religious motivations. So everything becomes part of the political calculus sometimes. I don't know. I hope that addresses your question. Okay, another one. Yes, please. Micro. Uh, my name is Ergus, and I'm former police officer of Albanian State Police. Um, I'd like to ask your opinion about this other side of the story, because a lot of people, not only people, uh, states as well, learn or deal with terrorism through media. And through media we can take one side of the story, what is non-state violent, uh, non-state actors, as well as the other side of the story. Organized, radical, armed, violent groups uh, hiding behind something. Someone called that a conspiracy theory? Someone called that? Your opinion, please. Thank you. I think you guys are asking the hardest questions. <laughs> this question. Why not? <laughs> um, I think, uh, okay, t two dimensions. One, of, one is this terrorism and the media, and the other is the conspiracy part of it. You know, the, uh, first, I think the easier one would be the media. Um, media, of course, look, uh, the te terrorists or the, those who are practicing violence for polit political purposes, 
uh, political purposes. They do, they do this to get attention, of course. As I said, the worst thing can happen to a terrorist organization is, is to be neglected. They would like to really have an impact. They would like to be recognized. In fact, if they don't get recognized, and then they, in fact, do even either further violence or they lose their momentum and they even put an end, put an end uh, to, the, to, to, to that part of it. But the, um, that's where the, I think the role of media comes in. The media, of course, is the, is the platform that they, um, they, they utilize in order to have as large as an impact. I remember in the early 1990s, for example, in Istanbul, there were terrorist organizations who were doing acts. They would either do it uh, right in the morning or right around evening because it would be the prime time for the impact. So that, that's, that's understandable. The media, does media have a responsibility? For sure. All the media institutions do have a responsibility not to, not to feed into the interests of the terrorist organizations. So reporting should, should have its own ethics and ethical responsibilities with respect to reporting about, about terrorist acts. But with respect to the conspiracy issue, you know, that behind terrorist acts there can be organized, um, organized institutions and other things. Everything is possible. In global politics, everything is possible. But as, as a scholar or as people who are studying these things, it would be, I would say that I still am yet to see major, major terrorist acts who need extra explanation. We know most of the time who does them, for what purpose, and, and what happens to them later. I understand, for example, that with respect to 9-11 even, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of these, these, these ideas. But for my own studies, I look at the people who died there are for real. There are graveyards, there are names for them. And then the impact is for real. There are diaries of the people who did that, and they are basically telling in their diaries why they did that, and those are... According to them, even there are legitimate issues they, they talk about. From there, maybe I should link it to this point. Look, when we, when we look at an issue and say that, hey, this one was useful for this group, therefore they must have been the reason behind it. That's not a very scientific way for us to proceed. We look at, still try to, we try to look at the facts to understand, right, to understand what, what, what, what happens in these cases. And most of the time, terrorist organizations, they, they do conduct a political activity through violence. And they always have a goal. They always have a goal. It's never accidental. So with respect to counterterrorism and what can be done for this, I think as I said in my presentation, what terrorists do professionally, they prepare a trap for the states and the governments to fall into, and the smart states don't fall into it and should not fall into it. But some states, in democracies particularly, because they are worried about their societal reaction to it, they feel like they have to act fast, and in the name of acting fast, they go and they make big mistakes and they fall into that trap, and they, they become a cycle, a part of a cycle that reproduces itself, and then we fall into pictures that last sometimes 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. I am sure now, for example, many of us must be thinking that in maybe in 1990s, late 80s, if Turkey, if Turkey had a much better understanding of the Kurdish question, right, and the PKK violence, probably that issue would have been resolved with much, much less energy, with much less losses, and with, with much less also costs to Turkish politics and the Turkish country. That's what I mean when I say, you know, falling into a trap or not. Buyurun. 
Ahmet Cevdet Gültekin. Sayın Hocam çok teşekkür ederiz. Güzel bir sunumdan dolayı. Bu yakın dönemdeki Irak ve Suriye'deki işit mi dersiniz? DH mı dersiniz? Bu terörizm midir? Cihadizm midir? Ölen de Allahu Ekber diyor. Öldürülen de Allahu Ekber diyor. Bunlar cennete mi gidecekler, cehenneme mi gidecekler? <gülüyor> Teşekkür ederim. <gülüyor> Bu sorunun altından kalkılmaz. Ama, <gülüyor> okay, um, of course, obviously I can't give an answer to where they are gonna go. But again, in my own understanding again, whoever spills the blood of an innocent, that's clear where that person should go. That's clear where that person belongs to. You know, there is no, there is no question about that. But this recent episode, the, the Syrian-Iraqi thing and then Daesh issue, um, that's much more complicated than even the early versions of the Al-Qaeda type of thing. This is much more complicated and much more multidimensional because it does have some of the characteristics that the old Al-Qaeda units had, and it does have some local characteristics, and it does have some characteristics that we are only experiencing now. These, these, some of these people learned violence in video games. Imagine that. Video games. Some came fresh out of the internet cafes in, in Europe, here and there. So it, it, it would be definitely a mistake to call this thing religious. That's my personal thinking. That's, that's, that's something else. It would require a lot of studies to understand this. There are a lot of pathological things in it. There are political things in it. There are geopolitical things in it. There are a lot of also, you know, espionage and other things in it. There is a lot of great rivalries in it. So if anybody comes in here, stands up and tells you that he has or she has a very good understanding, final understanding of Daesh or that part of the Middle East, I don't believe in him, you know. I don't think that's ever possible. It's way complicated. And I think we are at the only beginning of it in terms of understanding it. You know, the, but I have to confess something. The, in fact, I, I have a diagram for it too. But the, there is a group, there has been a group with the first part of the Al-Qaeda, most violent um, this religiously motivated, most violent fundamentalists, what they are trying to do basically is very simple. The Muslim world is a big world that on the peripheries there are these violent groups. What they are doing, what they are doing is this. By inflicting almost an internal civil war, they are trying to move into the center of this Muslim world. They want to be the flagship of the Muslim world. So it's an internal also struggle. It's an internal almost civil war. So in that sense, in that sense, there are a lot of responsibilities for many groups, not just the outsiders. My personal thinking is this. As long as this issue is left to the outside intervention, to the Westerners, this and that, I don't think there is any hope for change. I think the peace, solution, whatever it is, has to come from within the Muslim world. The Muslim world has to be producing much larger, much larger, much larger solutions for its own problems, and Daesh is one of them, I think, even though I don't know what exactly it is. But as I said at the beginning, whoever kills a civilian, an innocent somebody, doesn't matter how they kill it, whoever even hurts a civilian, and that's how I learned from my father, and that's how I believe, and that's how I am going to believe in. And that person, I don't think, has any place, neither in this world nor in the other world, in, in, in heaven or heavenly, you know, he heavenly manner. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I would basically like to ask the, the immigration, the, the, the 
construction of terror and the level of possible optimal censorship issue. Because uh, by using the oh, okay, change it. Okay. So by using the enhancement and the uh, echoing power of media, of course this one act has been reproduced all over the world in, in, in times and times stronger way. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, you have been in the combating side of this as well. What do you think could be the optimal level of, in quotations, censorship in mainstream media and on internet vis-a-vis -vis these terror acts? Because at some point, it may also really get to the point of this terrorist trap where the governments will be falling into, this time by excessive censorship, so freedom of speech would be really uh, diminished, and that would actually cause more tension, in, as, as you have explained in, in, in the figure. So what do you think is the optimal level of censorship so as to combat such actions? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hard to really strike a perfect balance between those two, probably. But my, my sense is this. I don't think there should be an official, that's why I wouldn't like to even call it censorship. I don't think there should be even governmental instructions towards media or any outlet how not to report about terrorist incidents. But I would prefer the responsible media institutions, the media world, really think about this, follow some world standards in some other countries, and come up with a responsible self-control rather than censorship or self-censorship. Because they would know better than even anybody else. Because they are the media people. They've been in that business for a long time. They would know better than some others what what, what would hurt the chances of counterterrorism, or what would be the terrorist manipulation? Ma manipulation. For example, it, it, um, imagine there are things happening in Turkey's southeast, right? In the name of the, um, the freedom of expression, these would have to be expressed, these would have to be reported, these would have to be reported. But if as government, as government, we officially tell them, hey, don't report anything out of, I don't know, Diyarbakir, Jizre, I, don't, I think that would be a mistake. See, I don't know how you could strike a balance, but I'm just speculating on my thoughts. But the governmental people and the media people and all the relevant people would, would, would sit together and talk about this and can easily, because I remember a practice of it years ago, even in Istanbul, can sit together and talk about this and almost define, more or less, how, how, what would be really ethically responsible in reporting or not reporting, or how of the reporting is important. Look, if you report something in a way that, that keeps generating fear, then you are falling into the trap. But if you keep reporting the same thing, that would not generate the fear, but at least would remind people that, hey, some cautiousness is necessary, they would be much better than the other. But still, even though I said all these things, I can't, you know, there is no magic formula in that one. That's why it's a constant debate. Because a lot of the times, media or pro-freedom of expression, people would say that, hey, that's censorship. And then the government would say that, no, that hurts our countering, countering strategies. But as somebody who worked years ago, in, on that part, I, I distinctly remember irresponsible reporting hurting the chances of counterterrorism. Some irresponsible reporting. But it would have to be really discussed, but it would have to be decided by the media institutions, independent media institutions themselves. That's why it shouldn't be, you know, a censorship, but it would be more like I call it responsible reporting or sometimes self-control even, self-control mechanisms. A very short follow-up, if I may. Yes. I don't know if you have studied uh, particularly, uh, but how would you assess the role of Al Jazeera, for example, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the 
issues in Afghanistan, in Iraq and Syria now, basically Al Jazeera Arabic or English, but in general, if you have some opinion on that, I would really like to yeah, hear you it. Know, the, uh, look, Al Jazeera Arabic, Al Jazeera English, CNN International, BBC, if you look at them for the same incident, you see a very different reporting. There is a major difference even between Al Jazeera Arabic and Al Jazeera English. Uh, if you want to see real hardcore reporting on those issues, you would have to look at Al Jazeera Arabic, for example, right? Al Jazeera English is a little bit different. So that's why I'm saying that in a particular country, maybe, those would have to get together and discuss. And it would have to be decided in, in, in environments like that. Nobody should tell anybody else, hey, here is how you are going to report. Because that is censorship. Because that is a political statement, and it might also get manipulated. You might say today, hey, don't report this because it hurts my counterterrorism strategies, but nobody knows what your counterterrorism strategies are, right? You can very well be manipulating it. That's why they would have to get together. This happened in Turkey a couple of times. I don't know what is happening nowadays, but. I remember, for example, at the height of the PKK terrorism in maybe 1990s, in the middle of 1994 or something, all the chief editors of the newspapers got together. They discussed among this themselves how they should be reporting this issue. I thought that was a good move by themselves for a responsible, responsible reporting. Um, I would like to ask you something about your statement, perfect, violent, non-state actors. With regard to our local issue, the PKK issue, um, a question. Do you think that the PKK is a perfect, violent, non-state actor? Um, with regard to your statement, a violent, non-state actor, which is perfect, has to have no relations or support by the state and or a state involvement. And a following question to this, um, can we count the PKK parties or the political wing of the PKK as a kind of state involvement? And with this regard, yes, we, because the PKK, you know, it was founded in 1974 and with its first terrorist attack in August, 84, I think, it has a continuation, survive until 2015, I think, 31 years. Do you, can we see the PKK as a perfect, violent, non-state actor? Thank you. Okay, that's a hard question as well. Um, one thing, the, of course, in, in this book, it's, it's more about the the, the violent non-state actorhood with a global reach. That's why we are comparing anarchists with violent jihadists. But I have my opinions about the PKK too, and, and I can just sum them up quickly. The PKK is, is, is good at survival. There is no question about that. But I don't think PKK is a non-state actor, violent non-state actor, because the the, the context, Middle Eastern context, Turkish context, is not necessarily a, a, a, a free floating context that a, a very independent, perfect non-state actorhood could emerge. In fact, I have some even opinions that some people might find it even uh, radical. I don't think the PKK is not is even an independent problem anymore. PKK or the Kurdish question is an international issue. Therefore, it's an, even an international problem. And then can't be solved with a lot, with a lot of regional also adjustments. Uh, so it's, it's in, in today's context, in, in today's Middle East, and the particularly almost like a failing Iraq, failing Syria, and um, does prevent... PKK type of organization acting independent enough. PKK can't act independent, but I am referring to the armed wing particularly. 
I'm not really referring to the political dimensions, but this PKK that I see can't be an independent. And I think Turkish authorities would also have to take that into consideration. You can't solve, that's my understanding, you can't solve PKK problem by yourself. It would require a lot of regional adjustments because it's, it's, it is beyond our reach. It is, other, it, is, it is playing with other actors. It is cooperating with other actors. I mean, think about Kobani issue, right? I mean, some people think that it, it became a strategic partner with other actors already. So I don't think it can act independent. Therefore, my response would be that, no, it's not even close to being a good non-state actor. It's, it's not. Uh. Any questions? Right, this one. Okay. Merhabalar hocam. Ben Reyhan. Ankara Siyasal'da doktora yapıyorum. Şunu merak ediyorum da bir örnek e, vererek sorumu soracağım. Yani normalde sizin eviniz aileniz olduğu gibi bizim benim de evim var. Eğer ben sizin evinize gelip Ailenizi öldürdükten sonra bir yer zapt edersem o bana mı e, bana e, bana mı terörist denilecek yoksa siz bana karşılık verdiğiniz zaman benim işte arkamda eğer bir güç varsa beni desteklenenler çoksa bana mı terörist denilecek yoksa size mi terörist denilecek bu durumu e, İsrail ile Filistin arasında nasıl değerlendiriyorsunuz ayrıca eğer biz e, işi de terör örgütü diyorsak niye İsrail'e terör örgütü demiyoruz? Teşekkürler. All right. Um, you know what? I don't think there's people keep debating it for political purposes, but I don't think this should be debated much. Doesn't matter whether it's a state or not. If somebody goes and hurts civilians, innocent civilians, damages them, inflict big damages, that can be comfortably called terrorism. There is no question there. But the problem with it, because who defines terrorism is also a political issue, right? Whoever feels powerful labels the other one terrorism, and that's where we get all these, you know, all these different reporting. But answer to your question, again, I'm sticking with the first principle that I mentioned at the beginning. Doesn't matter who they are. State actors, non-state actors, one person or even organized group, if they do kill civilians, if they do hurt civilians, if they do damage civilian environments, then, then they are terrorists. That's why, for example, even with respect to Kurdish question, it's my position that as long as PKK is involved in those type of atrocities, then PKK is a Perfect in that sense, terrorist organization. So, you know what, if, if you keep it outside of the politics, it's very clear, technically speaking. But, when, when it, but unfortunately, it becomes part of the politics. Then you start seeing all kinds of different interpretations. We don't want, nobody would want, civilians to be hurt. Innocent civilians. That shouldn't be done. That can't be done. Whoever does that is a terrorist. Kenan uh, Alperkök. I wanted to ask about your definition. You said um, it's the weak against the strong, in a way, a struggle between them. And in terms of ISIS or Daesh, whatever, um, when they occurred, it was indeed a struggle between weak and strong because there was a clear-cut Shi-Sunni um, struggle in Iraq. However, do you think that in terms of both global, uh, uh, in terms of global terrorism and in where this particular entity has come, uh, there's a thin lining which separates strong and weak. Is there a part where the terrorist organizations become the strong and whoever they were struggling against become the weak, like we see in Iraq today? Thank you. No, that, no that's a good question, actually. That, that does happen. 
Sometimes that's why we, we, you know, we didn't have time, but there is this overstretch problem that we, we, we mentioned. Sometimes they, they keep growing bigger and bigger, and they don't even know how to, how to manage it. That, and that appears to be the case in, in, in, in Syria and Iraq now, that a group, you know, it's not clear what the really true intentions, but it, it grew too big. And the, I'm not going to say unfortunately, but for example, the, you know, the air, air power, that pushes them outside of the cities, but that means even more stretch, right, overstretch. It becomes even harder now to go after them because they are now even more spread, more spread out. But here is one thing, maybe, uh, as the last thing we, I should be saying, bringing it back into that weak, strong issue. Look, the state system in the world today is, is not being balanced. There is a lot of unjust in, in today's world, and the state system is basically keeping the status quo, state system, and in that status quo, there is a lot of room for a lot of injustice, which is not being addressed. And, and it's only natural, this is not to justify terrorism, but it's only natural that there is all this transnational energy here and there, pump, you know, kind of rising to balance against this, this yes. status quo. So it is not going to go away. Today, it looks like Daesh in Syria. We are going to, for example, get the best coalition and then pressure them, and they are going to pop up in France. If you pressure them there, they are going to pop up somewhere else. And then when they pop up in a new environment, their look will be different even. And there will be days even they won't even look like Muslims. So it's not a Muslim issue. It's not a religious issue. It's a transnational loose energy. And as long as you don't address at the root causes, root causes would include political issues, social issues, economic issues, as long as you bring in more justice at any level, then you will have a big amount of terrorism, so-called terrorism. That's only inevitable. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for coming and see you next, our next panel. Thank you.